such as Sarah and Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Deborah, David, etc. Nor is there any mention of the great divine interventions in Israelite history, such as the Exodus or the entrance into the land, nor major religious motifs such as the covenant with Yahweh. On the other hand, while the distinctively Israelite aspects of the First Testament are absent from the wisdom books, the latter do share formal and thematic similarities with the wisdom traditions of the surrounding nations. In Mesopotamia, the Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians all successively produced multiple proverb collections, like the Book of Proverbs and portions of Kohelet. So too did the ancient Egyptians, who also developed the instruction genre that is paralleled in Proverbs 1 to 7. Both regions produced a number of works that question divine justice, in the case of innocent suffering, just as the Book of Job does, and the catalog could go on. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the scholarly response to this unique content was largely to ignore the wisdom books. A brief period of interest came in the 1920s with the discovery of some of the ancient international wisdom literature, especially the Egyptian instruction of Menemope, which was quickly recognized as the literary basis for Proverbs 22, 17 to 24, 22. However, in the middle of the last century, scholarly attention to the wisdom literature waned again sometimes taking the form of outright opposition. Harmon Geza called it a foreign body in the Old Testament's world, and this review view is reflected, however benignly, in the Old Testament theologies written in this period. To give just one example of his two-volume work, Gerhard von Rad relegated the wisdom literature to an appendix to the first volume labeled Israel's Answer. Horst Prus went farther than Geza, characterizing the wisdom literature as, quote, heathen, unquote, thinking that should be excluded from Old Testament theology. Although the scholarly estimation of the wisdom book's value has improved significantly since then, although after looking over the titles in the program, not at the CSBS, at least not this year, uh, since there are no other wisdom literature papers, uh, it has increased, but even a major promoter like James Crenshaw could refer to the wisdom literature in 1976 as, quote, an orphan in the biblical household. And then 34 years later, in 2010, still attributed to a different world of thought, all in italics to emphasize his point. Crenshaw's second point uh, points to the other area in which the wisdom literature differs from the, first of the rest of the First Testament. The wisdom literature's approach, and especially the underlying justification for the content of the book of Proverbs, Job, and Koheleth, is drastically different. The basis for wisdom teachings is reflection upon human experience, collected over the years and passed on from one generation to the next until codified in the books that we have. As we will see shortly, the majority of the book of Proverbs consists of observations about human behavior and human nature, plus analogies with the surrounding world. The book of Koheleth makes this approach explicit. Running throughout the book are the author's claims that he is reporting on what he has seen, observed, considered, experienced, and so on. This foundation in common human experience has implications for how the wisdom writers convey their insights, and especially how they seek to persuade their audience concerning what they have to say. Unlike the narrative portions of the Pentateuch and the historical books, the wisdom literature does not support its claims by asserting divine intervention in Israel's affairs. Unlike the prophets, the sages do not claim that their message was received directly from God via oracles and visions. And although they share some of the ethical concerns found in the Pentateuch's legal material, the wisdoms do not present them as Torah from Sinai. Instead, they seek to persuade not by appeals to external authorities, but through internal assent on the part of the hearer. They do so by presenting the material in such a way as to engage the listener or reader in the learning process. In what follows, I will reflect on this learning process within the book of Proverbs in particular, with occasional forays beyond. I will focus on the main forms in the book of Proverbs with the aim of identifying how they function pedagogically, i.e. the different forms that are used to convey readings, teachings to the reader. At the same time, I will attend to the educational methodology in the book of Proverbs, clarifying the underlying presuppositions concerning how one acquires wisdom and the attendant ways the sages accomplish this. The opening verses of the book of Proverbs spell out its purpose 
as one of instruction. Verses 1 to 6 constitute a single sentence starting with the title, The Proverbs of Solomon, Son of David, King of Israel. This is followed by a series of consequential clauses in verses 2 to 3 that elaborate the purpose as being for learning, understanding, and gaining instruction. The book is meant to teach the young and the simple, verse 4. But the mature, wise and person can and should profit from it as well. And then verse 6 concludes that this collection will enable one to understand four different forms. A proverb, a figure, the words of the wise, and their riddles. This list is neither exhaustive nor indicative of the order in which they occur, since the first wisdom form one encounters in the book of Proverbs is the instruction. The instruction genre is well known from the Egyptian literature spanning two millennia, from the period of the Old Kingdom, circa 2800 to 2200 BCE, to the instruction of Aung Shashanki in the 5th century BCE. These instructions share a number of characteristic features. The earliest ones are presented as a father's instruction to a son, and later these terms took on the technical nuance of a teacher to a pupil. They contain three main elements. A direct address to my son, reflecting the scribal tradition for a student, and containing a command that he hear, listen, etc. Second, we have motive clauses that give the reason for listening and obeying. These are usually the benefits that derive from the teaching, often introduced by key, for, although final clauses stating the consequence may also be used. There is little appeal to anything beyond the presumably self-evident value of the teaching itself. The teaching itself, then, usually takes the form of conditional and result clauses, i.e., if, then, although straightforward commands are also used. The focus is on exhortation and argumentation in support of the teaching, distinguishing it from the tendency in simpler wisdom sayings to make an observation and leave the moral up to the reader or listener. The focus in the Egyptian instructions is usually on how one should function at the royal court, and this motif is often assisted by attributing the instruction to a pharaoh or one of his advisors. But even without such an explicit connection, the purpose <coughs> remains the same, as seen by the nature of the advice that is given. Topics include how to deal with one's inferiors and superiors, proper table matters, the importance of truthfulness and courtesy, and warnings about and against women. The goal was to ensure that one did not offend the king or members of the royal court in either words or actions, and the instructions reflected the contemporary societal norms of proper behavior with its biases and prejudices. Symptomatic of this is the negative view of women. The instructions tended to paint women as temptresses who would try to seduce the young people and lead him astray. The dangers involved when such women were related to the pharaoh or influential members of the court would be obvious to all, and so students training to serve there were frequently warned against becoming involved with women, however innocently that relationship might begin. Let me give a blanket statement. I don't agree with this stuff. I'm just telling you what's in there. Okay. There are ten instructions in Proverbs 1-7 to with many of the same concerns as the Egyptian versions. The longest is chapter 2 of Proverbs. It opens with an address to my child, or my son, quite literally. Uh, and four verses that uh, constitute the exhortation to listen to the teaching. Verses 5 to 9 present various reasons why he should do so, following by three verses that contain the actual teaching describing the two paths of the good and the wicked, which is a common theme in the wisdom literature. But the chapter is more artfully constructed than this basic outline suggests. Proverbs 2 actually consists of a single sentence comprising 22 verses, or 22 lines in Hebrew, which is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It is not an acrostic in which each successive line starts with the next letter of the alphabet, but by echoing the length of the Hebrew alphabet, the poem does suggest that it is not a random collection of thoughts, but rather a comprehensive composition that expresses all one needs to know. This is reinforced through formal features of the poem that create a well-structured discourse consisting of two evenly balanced halves with 11 verses each, which are themselves arranged into three sections consisting of four plus four plus three verses. If we bracket the opening address to my child, we have the following. Part one consists of the first 11 verses of the chapter, in which the word wisdom or a synonym is repeated nine times. First section of four verses begins with the letter Aleph in the Hebrew word im or if. The next two sections, 
Both begin with the letter Aleph and the words as to me, then you will understand. Part two is 11 verses from verses 12 to 22, in which the word derek or way or path occurs nine times, just as wisdom and its synonyms did in the first half. The first two sections begin with Waman, which is the the eleventh uh, uh, letter of the Hebrew, sorry, the twelfth letter of the alphabet, in the word lehat silka to save you, and then the final section also begins with Lamed, uh in the word lemaam therefore. So you can see it's balanced in uh, three sections beginning with an olive, three sections beginning with Lamed, uh, the repetition of the, the two words matched by repetition of two words, etc. Each of these sections then deal with separate but related topics in a single sentence. First section is an extended conditional clause introducing wisdom as the object of the reader's desire. And the next four sections then describe the result of achieving that goal. One will gain religious understanding through the fear of the Lord, which will lead to ethical understanding, distinguishing righteousness and justice. These first three sections then deal with the acquisition of wisdom and its synonyms that are repeated in the first half of the poem. It is then followed by two more sections describing the protective result of attaining wisdom, followed by the instructions, actual teaching, i.e., this understanding, this gaining of wisdom will deliver the reader from evil men and adulterous women. Therefore, follow the teaching of the two paths, uh, using the wisdom, using the keyword of derrick or way or path that is repeated nine times in the second half. These six topics are then reflected and the other nine instructions in the book. So uh, this is a very nicely put together piece. Uh, they didn't uh, then follow through in sequential order, but you can see there uh, that uh, the first three are repeated in one instruction. Evil men are discussed twice, uh, and then uh, adulterous women are the topic of three instructions in keeping with the biases and prejudices in the ancient world. Um, so these uh, other nine instructions use the same approach, urging a child to conform to the teaching on the basis of the inherent value of the teaching itself without appealing to external authority. In addition, the three passages that deal with adulterous women, section 5, show how instructions can be adapted and developed, using additional forms as part of the larger instructions to reinforce their lessons. Within the first one, Proverbs 5, 15 to 18, includes an allegory in which one's wife is described as a cistern of water that should be sufficient for one's thirst, but not to be shared with anyone else. <laughs> Take the point. Uh, the second one, uh, 6, 27 to 29, uses the effects of fire as a metaphor for adultery. You'll get burned. And 7, 6 to 23, employs a didactic story about a young man being seduced. In some, Proverbs 22 is programmatic for the other nine instructions. It's only after the reader has worked through the first seven chapters, perhaps many times, that she would become wise enough to discern the overarching structures of Proverbs 2, and from there the connection with the other nine instructions. Next form, then, is the proverb. The majority of the book of Proverbs consists of wisdom sayings, which are two-line or occasionally more aphoristic sentences. The headings to Proverbs 10, 1 to 22, 16, and to Proverbs 25 to 29 identify them as Proverbs, Meshalim. Uh, a shorter section, Proverbs 22, 17 to 24, 22, this is the bit that is adapted from the instruction of Amun Mope, which is an Egyptian work, uh, calls on the words of the wise, and then a much shorter section simply states these also are from the wise. The common translation of mashal into English as proverb is not exhaustive, since the word is also used of parables, prophetic utterances, taunts, speeches, bywords, etc. However, proverb does actually reflect the contents of these portions of the book far better than any of the other renderings and corresponds to one of the forms named in Proverbs 1.6. Nevertheless, the material in these sections can be subdivided into two categories, the admonition or prohibition, as well as the sentence. The latter, the sentence, is by far the more common. By Walter Zimmerle's count, the admonition occurs only 25 times out of 402 sayings in the first two main sentences, so that uh, main collection. So that gives you a sense of the uh, uh, extent of the frequency. 
The two types can be distinguished by virtue of their mode of address. First, the admonition, as one would expect, uses the imperative while its counterpart, the prohibition, negates the command either with do not or you shall not. In either case, as we can see from these examples, the command or the prohibition is followed by a motivational clause indicating what will result from doing or not doing what the preceding line uh, urges. So first two are uh, admi admonitions, second two are prohibitions, and uh, each is followed in the second half by this is the consequence. At times, the admonition or prohibition plus the motivation can span more than one verse. For example, in these, the following examples, each element consists of an entire verse, with the first two lines being the admonition or prohibition, and the second two lines being the, uh, the reasons for following the advice. A single admonition or prohibition can be even longer. Proverbs 23, 6 to 8, the first verse contains a prohibition, and the motivation it uh, occupies the next two. Proverbs 23, 22 to 23 present an extended admonition of two verses followed by an equal two-verse motivation. But the longest of these is Proverbs 23, 31 to 35, where the initial verse advises against wine and the next four verses seek to motivate the reader through an extensive catalog of its negative effects. I won't read it. I'll leave it there for you to ponder as we anticipate the upcoming banquet. <laughs> and you decide whether to follow the advice or not. These longer motivations, especially the last one, are similar in length to the motive section of the instruction genre with which the admonition and prohibition have obvious structural similarities, namely a teaching followed by a motive for following it. They also share pedagogical approaches. Like the instruction, the admonition, or prohibition does not appeal to external authorities such as rulers, laws, or divine revelation. Rather, its authority resides in the motivation, which is rooted in observations of the consequences of one's action that the reader is expected to recognize from her own experience and accepted as valid. In contrast to the admonition and prohibition, the sentence is always in the indicative, as a simple statement about the way things are. As such, the sentence does not include any motivational arguments, but rather appeals to universal human experience. Sometimes this entails observations about human nature. Such sayings do not explicitly urge a particular course of action and in some cases, none is envisioned. So for instance, the first one here, uh, actually both of these simply describe different financial states, although most would opt to be rich if possible, I think. Uh, the first example, however, also raises the question of how an observer can know whether people are what they claim to be, while the second one forces to consider who are one's true friends. Another pair of examples, the uh, preferred mode of speech might be implicit in 15, one, but it is left up to the reader to discern what uh, that uh, preferred mode of speech is and then whether or not to act accordingly. And 2014 summarizes without comment the attitudes of a successful Hagler before and after a purchase. And if anyone's ever uh, had some dealings in the Shook in Jerusalem or probably not the Bay, uh, but uh, if you get a good buy, you, you, uh, you know how to boast about things. So these sayings provoke insights into human affairs and thus promote greater understanding of how society functions. Other wisdom sentences rely on analogies between nature and human affairs. Sometimes the comparison is stated explicitly through a comparative cough. And here are two examples, the second one being one of my favorite proverbs, uh, which I offer up for your reflection. Other times, the two statements are simply juxtaposed without a cough, and here we have another one of my favorite uh, 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 proverbs. Uh, the door turns on its hinges, a lazy person turns in his bed. Going back to 1989, when I was five, attending my first uh, uh, CSBS meeting, <laughs> I could have said uh, that the record skips, the lazy person hits the snooze button, uh, and that would be a comparable piece of wisdom. Once again, these analogies do not promote a particular way of behavior. They usually make the comparison explicit by adding comparative words. The NRSV, for instance, adds so at the beginning of the second line in 2614, so a lazy person turns in the bed, and it adds like at the beginning of 2617. Like one who takes a passing dog by the ears is one who meddles in the quarrel of the other. Unfortunately, this undermines the distinctive pedagogical effect of juxtaposing statements without explicitly comparing them. Even if the point of comparison seems obvious, 
When the sages do not state it explicitly, that requires the reader to supply it, thereby entering into the learning process rather than passively absorbing information. A major purpose of the sayings and proverbs is to categorize human experience into understandable areas in order to assist one in living one's life. In the words of R.B.Y. Scott, one of the founding members of the CSBS, the book contains, quote, the idea of order, of norms, rules, right values, and due proportions. This is expressed in Proverbs which bring to light the identity or equivalence of some things and the non-identity of others. The distinction of the appearance from reality, common factors and characteristics, cause and consequence, and also what is contrary to right order. The irregular, absurd, paradoxical, and impossible. Scott then categorized Proverbs into seven patterns that reflect the sages' efforts to bring order and structure to their experience. And while his proposal is now some 50 years old, it is still helpful for understanding the overall goal of the sayings collections in Proverbs. So let me just take you through these. The first pattern is identity equivalence or invariable association, which expresses things that appear different but are actually the same. Scott offers modern examples such as a friend in need is a friend indeed, or a penny saved is a penny earned, alongside biblical instances such as where there are no oxen there is no grain, and whoever flatters a neighbor is spreading a net for the neighbor's feet. The second category is non-identity, contrast, or paradox, i.e. things that at first glance seem the same, but on further consideration are not. Today we repeat Shakespeare's all that glitters is not gold, Although the correct formulation would be not all that glitters is gold, because gold glitters, and if all that glitters is not gold, and gold glitters, that means gold is not gold. Sorry, I'm being pedantic. Or we might uh, quote Robert Foss, good fences make good neighbors. The book of Proverbs expresses this category through aphorisms such as a soft tongue can break bones, or to a ravenous appetite, even the bitter is sweet. Scott's next proverb pattern, as you see here, similarity, analogy, or type, comprises things that are like one another, either in nature or in action. We can compare a chip off the old block and a time and tie wait for no one to the following sayings for Proverbs 25. Like the coal of snow in the time of harvest are faithful messengers to those who send them. One would think that snow in winter would be a bad, in uh, harvest time would be a bad thing, but the point is clarified through a third line they refresh the spirit of their masters. Two examples without an explicit comparison. A bad tooth or a lame foot. Trust in a faithless person in a time of trouble. Or cold water to a thirsty soul. Good news from a far country. A fourth proverb idiom deals with what is contrary to right order and so is futile or absurd, such as don't count your chickens before they're hatched, or what's the use of running when you're on the wrong road. Examples for Proverbs include why should fools have a price at hand to buy wisdom when they have no mind to learn, or once again, because I like it so much, a door turns on its hinges, a lazy person turns in bed. And read what you want into my own character. A fifth person, a first fifth proverb classifies and characterizes person's actions or situations. For example, children and fools speak the truth, and a rolling stone gathers no moths. Similarly, the book of Proverbs offers characterizations, among others, of the insolent, a scoffer does not listen to rebuke, the fool, the simple believe everything, a contentious partner, a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain, and the sluggard, another of my favorites, the lazy person buries a hand in the dish and is too tired to bring it back to the mouth. <laughs> Who knew Proverbs could be so much fun? Value rather than value, or priority, proportion, or degree. Most of us are familiar with modern sayings like a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or better late than ever. Within the Bible, you find it is better to be poor than a liar. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, or the more elaborate, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination, how much more when brought with evil intent. And the last of Scott's seven patterns, consequences of human behavior and character. Just as we might say, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Give an inch and they'll take a mile. Don't bite off more than you can chew. The book of Proverbs makes observations like, a glad heart makes a cheerful countenance, and whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on the one who starts it rolling. Excuse me. Uh, let me add two additional insights to Scott's seven categories. 
The first is that they are not always mutually exclusive. They may overlap, such that a saying exhibits more than one of these characteristics at a time. For instance, Scott's sixth pattern is uh, value, relative value, or priority, proportion, or degree. And sometimes this takes a simple, the form of a simple statement that something is good. And here are two examples for you to consider. Conversely, this could take the form of X is not good. For instance, Proverbs 19.2 will tell us that desire without knowledge is not good. Well, this advice in Proverbs uh, 24.13 about uh, eating honey, it's relativized uh, in 25.27, which uses the initial statement about not eating too much honey to draw a comparative lesson about life. At times, a... Uh, Statement of relative value also moves into the realm of, of what is contrary to right order, which is Scott's fourth category. And here I simply give you a few more examples. I won't read them for you because you can read them faster. Uh, this blurring of, of the categories is relevant for the learning process. Anyone who studies the book of Proverbs eventually realizes that these different proverb patterns that are meant to organize and structure one's experience of the world sometimes overlap. This transfer across categories leads to the realization that human existence is not, in fact, always neatly categorized, in case you didn't know that, and requires additional reflection in order to determine how to apply such proverbs in one's own life. The second thing to say about these categories also falls into the realm of relative value, specifically the better saying. The Hebrew syntax of these statements has a bearing on how the saying itself works to promote or provoke insight and understanding. The word order in Hebrew is almost always good as X more than Y. Often this amounts to a simple statement about proportional worth. And again, you can see a couple of examples. At times, the first element might seem a little less than desirable, but it is qualified by a positive attribute and therefore deemed acceptable, even without the secondary point of comparison. In these cases, the second line merely serves to reinforce the first. However, at the other extreme is a purely negative first part, where a positive qualifier, without a positive qualifier, sorry, and therefore with no immediately obvious redeeming value. It is only with the addition of the second part in these last two examples, introduced by a comparative min preposition, that the value of the first is brought into the view. The apparent paradox of the initial statement is resolved through the perspective provided by its comparison with another thing, action, possession, etc. Koheleth takes this latter approach further by presenting purely negative aspects as positive. In doing so, he calls into question the traditional wisdom concerning what is good and what is not. He may do this by following a positive comparison with a negative one. Good is a name more than good ointment and the day of death more than the day of birth. Alternatively, the author sometimes places the negative element first in the statement. In these last two examples, Koheleth even expands the basic better saying to add an explanation, which in the case of 7.3 at least seems a little bit counterintuitive. And I would simply remind you of one we saw earlier, Proverbs 15.13, uh, which seems to be contradictory, provoking the reader to evaluate Koheleth's gloomy advice even more deeply. Another feature of the saints' collections is the repetition of specific sayings either within a single collection or in distinct uh, collections. The degree of repetition varies. There may be verbatim duplication of an entire saying. Either the first or second line might be identical, or the same sentiment might be expressed in different words. An example of the first category is Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25, which are verbatim. Uh, and they uh, fall within one large section, but with uh, they span the borderline between the two halves. Related to verbatim duplication is the restatement of an idea with similar words, almost like long distance parallelism. And you can see here one's ways, deeds, pure, right, in one's own eyes, in the sight of the doer. Not exactly synonymous, but comparable. Similarly, two ideas can express similar ideas. Uh, they're not parallel, but they are comparable. Doublets that repeat only part of a saying show a far greater de degree of diversity. Often the first line is identical with the, when the second one differs. And here, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, and you can see the, the uh, variation to decide whether it is significant or not. And the second 
prepare. I'll leave it to the mothers in the room to tell me whether a mother's grief is comparable to being despised by your children. Uh, the first, uh, other times, the second line is completely different, resulting in an entirely new conclusion. So the first proverb here contrasts the rich and the poor, whereas the second line questions, uh, whereas in the second one, uh, questions the validity of the, rich, of the rich believing that their wealth will not protect them. So the result is rather different. Following pair also differ. Uh, in the first case, uh, in this case, the first example makes two statements about the proud, proud and the haughty, whereas the second one contrasts the fate of the haughty and the humble. Uh, the divergence in the second line can even change an indicative sentence into a prohibition. So here the first example is, uh, first uh, instance is simply a, an indicative statement. The second one turns it into an explicit moral. And alternatively, the uh, first line might differ and the second remains the same. This brings us to one of the most important questions of biblical studies that I always ask, so what? <laughs> From a diachronic perspective, such doublets constitute evidence of a lengthy compositional process involving the circulation of sayings in more than one context and their gradual incorporation into different collections that were eventually joined to form the Book of Proverbs as we now have it. On a synchronic level, they have implications for the reader's involvement in the learning process. Verbatim repetition and the restatement of ideas and similar words, especially a alongside less complete repetition elsewhere, highlights the duplication and calls for an explanation that the reader has to provide. Why are these sayings reproduced completely when others are not? What in their content is worth such treatment? How and why is their teaching more significant than other sayings? At the same time, repetition with divergence must also be taken into account. Different opening or closing lines relativize those sayings in their different literary locations. Why do they differ? Why is the saying appropriate in one context but not another? Clearly, if the content can be altered, then it is not universally applicable. But it is up to the reader to determine which version is applicable in concrete situations. The saying themselves do not provide the answers, they merely provoke the questions. This kind of ambiguity is also present in Proverbs 26, 4 to 5. This is not a case of proverbial duplication, but rather a prohibition followed immediately by the contradictory admonition. This calls to mind modern aphorisms like absence makes the heart grow fonder alongside out of sight, out of mind, or look before you leap while bearing in mind that the one who hesitates is lost. Well, which is it? Obviously, the situation determines the appropriate wisdom. You're being chased through the woods by a bear. You break through the trees, and there is a brief opening and then a cliff, and down, far, far down is water. Is it look before you leap, or the one who hesitates is lost? It depends on how close the bear is. <laughs> He's five minutes back, it's look before you leap, scout around, is there a path, what can you do? If you can feel his breath behind you, it's the one who hesitates is lost, you jump and you hope for deep water. It's the context. Being able to determine the proper response to any situation, however, is what characterizes an individual as wise. And the key to making that determination is experience, both one's own and that of society mutually interpreting each other, complementing and supplementing individual insights with the collective experience and vice versa. In short, readers of Proverbs have to decide when and when not to answer fools according to their folly, and the juxtaposition of the two sayings in Proverbs 26, one after the another, requires that they make that judgment. Yet another type of ambiguity is created when two lines of a proverb do not fully match each other as either synonymous or antithetical parallelism. These deviations from the norm should not simply be lumped together as synthetic parallelism, to use Bishop Bloat's cop by the catch-all term for whatever didn't fit into his first two categories. <laughs> for, since the two lines of many proverbs are semantically balanced, the reader expects that to be the norm, and the exceptions stand out as intentional and call for an explanation. Since Michael B. Fox has already examined the phenomenon of what he calls disjointed proverbs, I will simply present two of his examples to illustrate the matter. Proverbs 13.5. The two halves do not fully correspond to one another. While the righteous and wicked are standard polar opposites of the wisdom literature, the second part of each line are not antithetical. The first line presents an emotion directed against an abstract object, while the second line describes the negative consequence of some unspecified action. 
Fox solves the problem by providing a consequence in the first line that is the opposite of the consequence in the second line plus an action in the second line in contrast the, the emotional one in the first. Following all that? The result is, this is what Fox comes up with, adding the words in italics in the first and second lines to get a more balanced two halves. Another example is Proverbs 27.6. Once again, we have imprecise parallelism between the two halves of the same. Friend and enemy are clearly opposite, while wounds and kisses might be approximately so. However, there is no apparent correlation between faithful and profuse, to say nothing of why numerous kisses in and of themselves are undesirable. But the problem is removed by elaborating the divergent nature of wounds and kisses in keeping with the expected uh, attitudes of a friend or an enemy. Faithful, but few are the wounds. Profuse and treacherous are the kisses of an enemy. In both cases, the imprecise parallelism has provoked a reader, in this case Fox, to consider why the two lines of each proverb do not cohere more precisely, and then supply additional material in order to produce a more satisfactory result. As Fox notes, by not making the two lines match more explicitly, the author has challenged the reader to do so, thereby engaging in the learning process itself and ultimately adding to the wisdom contained in the book of Proverbs. But while Fox's solutions to these and his other examples are persuasive, they should not be considered definitive. Instead, subsequent readers should look for additional ways to come to terms with these and other disjointed Proverbs, thereby continuing the learning process for themselves. According to Proverbs 1.6, the book will also help us understand figures. Three forms can be included under this heading, two of which occur only once and twice, respectively, in Proverbs. An allegory is an extended metaphor in which there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements in the text and things outside of it. And I've already mentioned Proverbs 5, 15, 18 to 18, uh, in which a cistern corresponds to a wife, as verses 18 to 20 makes clear, and the marauder refers to sexual activity, which the addressee should draw from his own cistern or his own wife, while presenting others from enjoying it from that same source. A second kind of pro uh, figure in Proverbs is a didactic story that presents a moral. This form occurs in 7, 26 to 23, 24, 30 to 34. The first narrates the seduction of a young man, and the second describes the decrepit property of a lazy person. Neither appeals to the speaker's own experience, but rather to what he has observed, observed followed by the lesson be drawn from the story. A more frequent enigmatic form in Proverbs is the numerical saying, which involves a numerical progression introduced with the formula x, x plus 1. With one exception, this form is clustered in Proverbs 30, the other one is Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. It occurs in other uh, wisdom books, and the X, X plus one sequence is also found in a number of other biblical books and elsewhere in the ancient Near East. Often they simply list uh, incremental numbers in successive lines without explicitly using the X, X plus one formula. For instance, Micah 5, 4 asserts that seven shepherds and eight rulers will defend us against the invading Assyrians, and Hosea 6, 2 hopes that after two days he will revive us on the third, he will raise us up. Amos 1 to 2 does employ the formula, castigating different nations for three transgressions and for four, but with the exception of Israel, he only mentions one transgression. The wisdom usage differs, however, in that it enumerates individuals, individual elements up to the higher number. The point is not just to list the number of things, but to lead up to and emphasize the final element in the series, which often presents uh, Surprising twist in Proverbs 30:18 to 19 uh, exemplifies this. If so, the numerical saying clearly has been developed by the sages in that it does not just point out paradox in language, but attempts to classify and categorize. In addition, there are a number of comparative sayings in Proverbs that present a shocking image which draws the reader or listener up short. The first part initially looks like a statement of what is contrary to right order, but closer examination indicates that it goes beyond this to raise a question. The absurdity of the image makes us answer, what is this about? Such sayings are often uh, instances of directly juxtaposed lines with an explicit statement of comparison. Uh, and again, you have the examples here. 
But if the first part of the saying is formulated as a riddle question, then the answer lies in the second half of the saying. This point is reinforced by this example in which you have a straightforward <coughs> sentence and a uh, less explicit comparison, but if you recast the first line as a question, it could serve as a riddle. Granted, the recasting of specific numerical sayings or proverbs as riddles is speculative, but at the very least, the preceding examples do engage the reader or listener in the text to, in order to puzzle out the answer to the questions. And now, the part you've all been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> the basic data upon which the wisdom tradition reflects is human experience. The premise behind most of the sayings in Proverbs is that this is the way things are, and this is the way things work. The reason the wisdom teachers can make such assertions is that they are transmitting the cumulative wisdom of the culture built upon the collective experience of the larger society. This is a result of trial and error. As we all know, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so, even when the uh, wisdom writers do add motive clauses to support an explicit command to follow a certain course of action, that very line of argumentation is itself based on experience. If you do X, Y will happen, or do this so that you will reap this reward. But more often, it is a simple statement of cause and effect, and the reader is left to draw a conclusion as to the proper course of action. The attitude of the wise, therefore, is that the truth of what they say is self-evident. But at the same time, if the basic principle of wisdom instruction is that insight is drawn from human experience, then one must always be open to new insights coming from that source, including insights that are directly opposite to the conventional wisdom, so-called. This happens within the wisdom tradition itself. The book of Job is a vehement protest against the standard wisdom doctrine of retribution that the good are always blessed and the wicked are always punished. I imagine Dr. Phil asking Job, how's that working out for you? <laughs> uh, similarly, Kohelet takes a rather cynical stance towards previous wisdom traditions, frequently turning established proverbial wisdom on its head. There's a secondary effect of this approach as well. It implicitly involves the reader or listener. It challenges us to reflect upon what has been said in order to decide whether or not it is correct. It draws us into the teaching process and transforms it into a learning process. In other words, it makes us examine individual sayings in order to determine whether or not they are consistent with our own experience. The corollary to this is that we also check our experience against the saying. Does our own experience of a particular situation match the experience that underlies the saying? If it does not, why not? Perhaps there is something in my personal experience that makes it incompatible with a particular saying. If we compare the wisdom tradition with our own life experiences, we can either conclude that a specific saying is incorrect, at least in some cases such as my own, or it may be that my experience is inadequate and it needs, needs to be supplemented by the wisdom presented in a given saying. In one sense, it doesn't matter what conclusion I draw. What is for, far more important is that I have drawn it. I have entered into the process, and in so doing, I have integrated it into my own experience. I have done what the sages intended. I have learned wisdom. Thank you. <laughs>